trying to do, Lisa, is understand this pilot program. Right. I guess that's a simple way to put it. Yep. Awesome. Should I should I dive right in or? Well, just let me say this <laughs> whenever you're ready to stop. But let me just thank the the um, the capital committee. I know this is a special kind of um, opportunity for us to present this part of our capital requests that separate from our others. And it really uh, we really appreciate the time uh, to to be able to get all the details together. So I just want to say that publicly. Thank you. Ditto. Well, we yes. Thank you. you. Coming before us and explaining it to us. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I assume everybody met uh, Lisa while they were waiting for me to jump on. So um, this is Lisa Radner, director, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. director of technology and digital learning. So take it away, Lisa. Thanks. Okay. Can you all see my, my yep. screen? The famous Zoom words everybody asks. Can you see my screen? Okay, well, thank you. Um, again, thanks for this opportunity to, to share with you much more detail than when I was last here in January around the pilot classrooms proposal. Um, I adopted uh, this EdTech pilot framework that Digital Promise has out. It's a kind of a, a, a guideline for schools that are trying to um, pilot EdTech. It's an eight step process. Um, like identifying the need, discovering and selecting your products, plan, train, et cetera. So tonight I'm gonna to share with you our three steps we've, we've gone through so far, and that is identifying the needs that we're trying to address in this pilot. Number two, discovering and selecting potential solutions. So I'll take you through some uh, solutions, some products that we've been looking at and some estimates on cost. And then number three, our planned approach. So number one, identify the need. What are the uh, problems that we're trying to address? What are we trying to learn in this pilot? So um, I asked uh, not the $64,000 question, but a, a number of questions to um, different stakeholders in our community. Um, we talked to, I talked to the uh, digital learning committee, which is the DLC there. Um, we ran a workshop around what does the future classroom look like, talked to fac faculty in a number of discussion groups after school, worked with Ron and Dan to get feedback from them and get ideas. Also went through a leadership workshop, Back to the Future, sorry for my acronyms there, <laughs> and, uh, and spoke with students as well, especially the superintendent's council, and asked these three questions. What have we learned from this remote hybrid learning experience that we want to take forward? What are the positives? What problems still remain that we want to address? And what are some ideas around what that, how we might address them? Which technologies should we choose to try? To um, get these ideas and, and, and figure out what our challenges or problems are, I adopted the design thinking framework. So in these discussions, we went through and looked for the possibilities, asked a lot of questions, tried out new ideas with each other. Um, all in all, coming up with a uh, prioritized list of problems we'd like to address in the pilot. And actually like a paper prototype, if you will, of what a future classroom might look like. The overarching question, the how might we for this pilot is, how might we redesign the learning environment in ways that will transform teaching and improve student learning at Cohasset Public Schools? That's a pretty big question, but that's essentially what, what we're all going for. And we wanna fall in love with the problems, not lead with the technologies that are kind of out there and kind of sounding cool. We wanna talk about what really matters to us and what are the problems we're trying to address. And really what we care about the most are student outcomes. So the scope of this pilot is not going to be about technologies that might enhance operations or any administrative tax tasks, like getting gaining efficiencies there. We're focusing solely on the teaching and learning that's going on in the classroom. So 
So in the discussions, I asked uh, participants to think about and look at their current classroom learning environment and actually just identify what are the elements of your current classroom? What are we talking about when we talk about a learning environment? Um, so these are some snapshots of photos um, taken around the schools. And we talked about, you know, what are the digital elements and what are the physical elements? You can see projectors in the ceilings, you can see desks and chairs, but you also can see projected, there's a digital element, there's content that's being shared digitally. And there are different ways that we communicate and collaborate digitally. In the sessions, we brainstormed. So this is a jam board. Um, so virtually we kind of threw post-its basically up on a wall and uh, talked about what are the improvements to the current classroom environment that we'd like to see in this future post COVID world. Um, and you can see that we started to group um, some of these into some categories here and just taking a look like um, teacher stations and having some more flexibility around teacher stations you can see some notes and ideas about audio, improving audio quality, um, and gaining some collaboration stations with students. <clears throat> so again, I sort of like looked at all the different discussions and different posted boards that, that came out of those discussions and tried to tie some themes together and some common um, uh, problems and ideas that people were, uh, were sharing. In summary, the top needs, number one, upgrade the audio-visual display system. There's a lot of uh, feedback about poor audio quality, teachers not being able to hear students speaking, students not being able to hear teachers speaking very well, or the display systems, um, audio in general. The actual visual of the display might be askew or just hard to see. <clears throat> and in number two, untether. The word tether came up a lot. Uh, where teachers and students kind of felt um, restricted to their physical space, whereby if a teacher was uh, wired to the display, so they, they were kind of tethered to the top, to the front of the room, and students felt like the furniture and the, the space itself was kind of rigid and they weren't able to move around as much. And some of this, uh, we should obviously say state is, you know, COVID related because they're spaced out. Um, but when we were asking them, you know, asking them to kind of envision beyond COVID, um, still this, this theme kept coming up. And then for three and four, really, you know, it, it, we, we do want to relieve our IT operational expenses or break fix. Found out from, from our um, <clears throat> IT team, excuse me, our IT team, that some of our projectors are as old as 2013 and we're kind of replacing instead of upgrading. Um, and in number four, we do have some current technologies. Let's really kind of push those in the pilot and see what the return on investment are for those kinds of technologies in tandem with anything that's new. And you can see some quotes here from, from uh, <clears throat> some of our participants. When we visual, if we can visualize the top needs, so if we were up to upgrade our AV systems, again, we're going from the left-hand side, a very teacher-centric, outdated display with the projectors in the ceiling, pull-down screen, maybe a whiteboard, to a very student-centered interactive panel. And there's two choices here, excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> I was explaining earlier about my challenging uh, throat uh, allergy problem here, sorry. So um, we'll see a trend with the technology um, to either like a short throw interactive laser projector over a whiteboard. It would turn any whiteboard into an interactive display or an interactive LCD panel. So this is like <clears throat> having a TV screen on your wall, finger touch or stylus to interact with. <clears throat> Also, uh, moving away from that tethered to a physical location where the teacher, you can see, is kind of like stuck at the front, wired laptop to the display, individual student desks are facing forward to a more flexible space. In this photo, the teacher's uh, interactive display, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> The teacher's interactive display is coming towards the group of students. 
and the students are situated and grouped kind of facing each other. The furniture is flexible. It's enabled them to kind of group in different ways in the classroom. And you'll see that the <clears throat> teacher is able to interact with the panel using the operating system on the panel itself or and or the teacher's lesson is uh, being projected to that display from her laptop in the, in the photo without having to wire right to the display. <clears throat> <clears throat> also, from uh, we want to move away from the sage on the stage in terms of audio where the teacher is talking and kind of um, uh, projecting from a, a single voice to being able to uh, engage every student and be able to um, <clears throat> engage in small group or whole group. So I'm going to play this video for you while I chug my tea. And uh, I hope that you'll notice in the video actually kind of all of these things at play, the video is going to um, really highlight the audio enhancements in the classroom, but you'll notice all the, the, um, the different elements that I've kind of been highlighting all together in this video. I think it kind of sums up best what we're looking for. In most classrooms, students spend a significant part of their day listening to teachers and other students. In fact, 75% of learning in elementary schools occur through listening activities. Yet 30% of children in K through three have some form of mild hearing loss. So hearing clearly in the classroom can be a real challenge. At Lightspeed, we create access to listening and learning between teachers and students. We make audio technology that effectively enhances listening create an equitable, engaging, and collaborative learning environment. Our whole group classroom audio systems provide a high level of speech intelligibility to evenly distribute the teacher's natural voice throughout the classroom, enabling students to hear every word. With our small group instructional audio, educators can listen into authentic student conversations to gain active insights, assess student learning, and increase student engagement. We understand the impact that audio can have in changing classroom environments. Learn more about how our products transform classroom dynamics at lightspeed-tech.com. All right. <clears throat> Just if there were any things that, that you noticed, hopefully you, you saw the um, furniture was kind of able to be pulled apart, brought back together. You saw obviously the audio enhancements the uh, <clears throat> student laptop was right next to the paper notebook. So there's lots of fluidity and flexibility in the physical space um, and in the ways that uh, students and teachers can interact with each other. <clears throat> so our goals for this pilot are kind of two phases I see. The first phase would be to identify the elements of a consistent upgraded AV model. We wanna look at um, do we need short throw projectors or LCD panels? Do we need both? And do we need fixed or portable? And we also want to look at interactive, so touch or stylus <clears throat> versus non-interactive displays. Number two is to find a solution for this tethered, tethered teacher. We can look at different teacher devices <clears throat> and look at different casting and collaboration apps. In phase two, we'd iterate, um, but, and I could see us going for some CEF grants where we could try some kind of emerging innovative technologies in the space, like um, AI live streaming, auto tracking cameras, virtual reality carts, digital signage, and kiosks. Those are some from the research that have, uh, have emerged as kind of uh, <clears throat> more innovative and, and we'd have to figure out I'd like to go through CEF grants to kind of figure out where they might be a best fit by, um, by trying through CEF. And then third is determining flexible furniture needs. <clears throat> I see this as a separate initiative and something probably led by the buildings um, and should go hand in hand with the technology. As you saw in the video, you know, to really get that, that um, vision of that fully flexible space, the furniture needs to go hand in hand with that. So discover and select, what have you been looking at? 
Um, <clears throat> as far as criteria, we want to make sure that we select technologies that meet our needs, solve our problems, and support our instructional model. So our instructional model is the SAMR model. And we want to make sure that we're getting the best, the best in class for ed tech solutions. <clears throat> so we looked at um, technologies that were highlighted at the MassQ conference, looking at trends in technology research like Gartner and Forbes, talking to other schools, and talking to different resellers to see what their top brands are. So I talked to Pro AV Systems, CDW, <clears throat> CCS, and VCS. The top options that emerged, um, kind of cross-checking everything, Epson for short throw laser, ViewSonic and ClearTouch for the LCD panels, uh, Lightspeed was a top runner for audio. In the untethered teacher, <clears throat> we can again leverage the operating system that comes <clears throat> with the panel, excuse me. And we can look at different two and one devices to either replace or supplement their laptop. So Microsoft Surface Pro 7, Ron shared with me that they had a very successful pilot with the uh, fire department. So that's something we'd like to <clears throat> understand the learnings from and maybe try in the classrooms. I'm so sorry about my voice. I'm pushing through it though. <laughs> um, the untethered teacher can also be achieved through this portable panel that can move throughout the room. And then for collaboration, we'd look at, we actually have no additional cost here around um, the different kind of software and apps that we can use. <clears throat> and the student collaboration, the students really <clears throat> have their own devices either through BYOD. I feel pretty confident about the um, numbers and types of devices that we provide K through five and the apps that we own currently and can try here to facilitate collaboration in the cloud. Before I get to costs, I'm gonna just shoot the plan to you, which is we'd love to um, <clears throat> kick this off officially with leadership by going through a, um, an exercise that would take our paper prototype, this is just me sketching out the ideas that we kind of came up with, and uh, converting that to a t 2D rendering through uh, in partnership with CDW. This is a free exercise, it's a two week exercise. <coughs> and we take that rendering and then we can make it into real life should we go forward. We would select the classrooms and super user teachers and really build out building based goals and a vision with the, with the building leaders. We would need to uh, select our partner out of those four, four resellers <clears throat> and get some final quotes and come up with our implementation plan. Then I see us from running this pilot for three months, October to January, where we would collect data. We could um, possibly go for CEF grants in November and then run a phase two or iteration in January. So as far as cost estimates, one pilot room, I'd like to go with one portable set of the Lightspeed <clears throat> Red Cat uh, mics, one uh, ViewSonic interactive panel, uh, or one clear touch. <clears throat> Those were the two front runners. So out of the classrooms, I'd like to get like one clear touch and one ViewSonic to compare and contrast. Situate Public Schools did something similar and really, they really like clear touch. I don't really know reasons why, but I'd like to see what, work for, what works for us best. And then one Epson short throw projector. So again, we can compare the fixed AV to the portable moving around the room. What are the affordances of each? How would we use one or the other? What's best for us? And in what classrooms? For the teacher device, they all have their own laptops. Maybe there's an extra uh, tablet, <clears throat> but we would get um, another uh, two-in-one a two-in-one device, a Microsoft Surface, or a similar device, which runs about 1100. And then we have to build in costs for uh, mounts, charging stations, cables, <clears throat> and other carts. So these estimates are based on the quotes from CDW and ProAV. I did not include installation fees because after talking to Ron and 
and Dan and picking their brains. And then the fact that we're going much more portable with the technologies, with the exception of the Epson projector, that they really, really shouldn't need them to do much installation for this. We'd like to go with four rooms, one room per building. So we could try one room in high school, one in middle school, one at Deer Hill, one at Osgood. We would have a super user teacher per each classroom. We would have our instructional technology spe specialists, myself, the IT team, also trained in supporting, but then have the opportunity to cycle other teachers through those classrooms so that they can learn, they can try, and we can get even more feedback. So those are um, the goals, the, the, the uh, plan, the approach, and the uh, estimated cost per room and total for four rooms to go through this pilot. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> so sorry I for my voice. I a couple of questions, <laughs> and I'm sure other people probably do also. Um, but why don't we start with... Uh, you, Ralph, if you have any questions. Well, I, I guess, uh, you know, these are, obviously I haven't had the time to really spend a lot of time with it. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make an observation though, which is kind of interesting for me anyway, and may you may disagree or agree with me on this observation, but <laughs> in, a, in a way, what we're saying is we want to go back to actually the teacher interacting more directly with kids and not being tethered. That's, that's what I really see. It, in fact, it harkens back to a model where perhaps it's in the movies and not for real, but it harkens back to a time when teachers could move about a classroom interacting with children as necessary as they actually began their learning. So what we're really trying to replicate with technology is something that happened simply by human interaction. In a way, that's what's going on here. Um, so I don't disagree with it. I just think it's an awfully expensive thing to do. Um, and if you figure there's a hundred classrooms and we do implement this, um, you know, you're in the up in the 1.2 million and so on numbers. It's really a lot of dough if you actually do implement something like this. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing is I, and from the technology point of view, um, pretty much everything has gotten away from projecting these days. It's gotten to either uh, mirroring or, um, I guess the other word I'm trying to remember is, um, oh, it's casting. Casting. You know, casting, yeah. That you don't really ever really want to end up with a projector again. You don't need to. Um, you can use your own computer to, to cast and or mirror whatever you want to project to anybody's uh, laptop or, or device and also to any board that you have. So I don't know. I'm just looking at it and saying, I don't know whether this is the right thing to do or not. I just know it's getting back to where we once were, where people actually migrated among the kids, or the teachers mm -hmm. did. And, and um, the technology has almost inhibited that to some degree by forcing people to be tethered. So now we're getting away from tethering, which I agree. Um, it's just very expensive to get away from it. That's kind of how I look at it. But I do like, very much like the idea you've tied in the concept, which I had asked for in the beginning, which was how is this going to improve mm -hmm. uh, children's performance or, or whatever it might be. I think that's an absolutely essential aspect of this or why do it otherwise. So anyway, thank you very much for listening. You've done a very good job. So I appreciate it. Thanks. <clears throat> and just a comment on that. I, and you'll have these slides, but um, you know, it's, it's not so much going back as really preparing them for the future, the students. And they are going to be able, if they aren't already, to uh, fluidly um, move between a digital world and a physical world. Um, so that untethering also applies to students to be able to um, not have to be confined to the four physical walls of the classroom. So be able to move around the classroom, but also through the cloud and through <clears throat> technology to reach beyond that classroom um, and, and connect with other classrooms and other uh, contexts around the world. And I pull this up because the, the model, the SAMR model enables bl a blended learning environment, which really is what, what targets the transformation. And these transformations, the transformation provides students with those 21st century skills and higher order thinking um, skills that they will need to be successful in those future workplace. The future workplace, that's um, the, the jobs of the future that seem to be um, you know, rapidly changing at all times. Um, so as much as I 
I, I suppose, I guess I'm saying that I uh, may have um, been too heavy on the physical mobility when I'm really talking about also enabling uh, flexibility and, and, and collaboration beyond the physical space through the digital. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Susan, do you have <laughs> any questions? Um, so Lisa, my, my question was, um, that there are a lot of, um, projecting devices in the, in the pilot classroom is the goal to play with them all and determine which one we like the best. And, and then down the line, the, the cost of a outfitting a classroom is lower than this, right. or will these devices always be in the, uh, classroom? Great, great question. So. <clears throat> One, it looks like there's a lot in here. So it's really um, one panel, an LCD panel and one short throw. I wanted to try uh, that panel to be either ViewSonic or ClearTouch to try one or the other in terms of brand and then make a decision going forward, which one would be um, most, most um, best fit for us. And also within this is um, the panels themselves can be mobile, as you saw on a cart, on wheels. Mm -hmm. So we also want to test if we went with the panel, do we want a fixed wall panel or do we want to be able to move that around? And in what, what context, what ways would we use that um, to impact student learning? So um, so it's, it may, I may look here like three, but it's actually two, a short throw against the wall and, and a portable panel. Does that answer your question a little bit better? Yes, yes, it does. But I, I like Ralph. I still see the projector as being similar to the panel, except that you did say that the projector can be interactive on the whiteboard, right? Yep. Um, and it I, oh, sorry, too, a little bit of duplicity, but it 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 is duplicity, and you, you're right to to call that out. Um, the point is, it's a pilot to test and see where are my goals whether, here we are, whether we want to go with the short throw projector or the LCD panel. The panel is sort of like the wave of the future, but are we, is it there yet? Does it meet our needs? And where, how do we use it? Do we go, do we go from in-ceiling projectors and pull down screens to the LCD? Do we go interactive? Do we go fixed? Do we go okay. portable? All um, right, so, so I, I, I think we're saying the same thing. So this pilot classroom for uh, four classrooms at 51,000. That is not the number necessarily going forward because you're going to make a decision on yes. whether we're going with the uh, yes, yes. fixed projector or the LCD. So that number goes down. That yes. number goes down and also interactive versus uh, non-interactive and uh, the size of the screen. So I went with the 75, which is the recommended, but we could go down. And then there's a 6,000 series or the latest is a 7,000 series. We could go a little down. So one of the first, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of the steps now is to get that final quote um, from our, you know, reseller. And part of the selection here has to do with training and support and just kind of, you know, mm -hmm. what we can get out of that partnership as well. <clears throat> Any other questions, Susan? Nope, I'm all set. Okay, thanks, Brian. Questions? Yeah, just a handful of thoughts. Um, uh, just a funny anecdote, you know, when COVID kicked in, I actually went shopping for, for a theater for the backyard uh, and a 20 foot blow up screen and some speakers that I could set up quickly and easily and um, get people together with, with social distancing. distancing. Um, so happy with the Epson choice. Um, that's definitely the right way to go. Um, and I see their partner was smart on the software. Um, with regards to the panels, ViewSonic and ClearTouch, it looked like they come with some type of different software. And I guess my question is whether or not that software is from your perspective, you know, equivalent to smart. Um, is it just something, you know, cheap and inferior that they happen to bundle and we're gonna need to go with smart anyway? How, how do you think about the software? That's question yeah. number one. Uh, do you want to, so I'll answer that one first. Um, <clears throat> I do know that Snowflake won some award, I think last year for some best in class at a tech show. 
So um, I don't know the answer as to what the differences are. I don't know which one is best. Smart okay. is certainly a very well-known uh, brand um, in interactive whiteboards. I went right. through a full training in smart learning software. I was blown away by that. <clears throat> um, but if you look here, there's no additional cost to trying any of these. Right, so, fair point. Yeah, fair point. so the, the point is let's try them, no additional cost and see what, what makes the most sense. Right, and if we don't like the software with the ViewSonic, we can always use smart software on a touch screen of our choice, is that right? It just happens that Epson is partnered with Smart. Right. Smart is providing this 90 day free trial. We could, we can, we don't, we can even use Smart learning software without a projector. You can, so we basically, we can mix and match the medium <laughs> versus the software. None of these is, is, is closed and, and, and sort of bundled with a, with a sort of a, a fixture partner. Um, no, but I think the operating systems on the panels themselves, for example, yep. I think. I think the clear touch is Android based. It's one or it's ViewSonic or the other. So, you know, okay. but we're so that could be a limiting Google factor. Classroom, we're, we're Chromebook. So I don't foresee that being a challenge. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and, and based on the feedback you're, you're getting from, from other folks who have, have gone through this trial process, does the Epson interactivity, you know, come close to matching that of an actual touch screen? That's that's the question. Um, okay. I think I think I mean they already have the seven thousand series, but the Epson's the Epson Laser. It's like the eight thousand series. I guess according to the resellers, is pretty slick and pretty pretty comparable. So again, what what are the differences between between a projected display on a whiteboard that makes it interactive versus uh, a TV screen type panel. You know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, and that's why we want to try. Okay, it's, it's really going to be about the sensitivity of the peripheral to, to the touch. Um, I, yeah, I, I and guess. I think that there's also um, inclusivity and accessibility uh, factors. Like, if there's a finger touch um, interface, uh, we may need styluses for students uh, who have mobility issues. So we want to make sure that you know we have an inclusive, equitable lens when we look at these as well. Okay, um, I, I guess the other comment, I'd, it's a comment and a question. Um, you know, when you look at your cost per room, it's the majority of it is actually not coming from, you know, the interactive display. It's coming from all the other stuff. So it's, you know, 1600 bucks for the, you know, for the audio, it's 1100 bucks for the Microsoft Surface. Um, so here, it, and then obviously they're, you know, they're, they're either carts or their installation costs if you, if you fix them to the wall. Right, so you know there there is actually um, a lot of mileage that can be can be had in focusing on these other costs. Um, so a few questions to that end. You know, first the audio system. You know, I, I literally picked up you know four Bose speakers. Um, they were like forty bucks each, and they were on sale for thirty. Right, and you, know, you can create thundering surround sound, very high quality surround sound. Um, in an outdoor space, I can't even begin to imagine what it would do inside. Um, so I guess I'm struggling with the idea that we need a $1,600 sound system for a small space the size of a, of a classroom. Uh, how, how convinced are we that this is a need as opposed to a solution that's looking for a problem? So the, one of the problems, is, so one of the problems is audio um, amplification, right? Which is yep. solved by a Bose speaker. But another challenge is student voices and teacher voices, speaking of terrible voices, um, <clears throat> and being able to um, uh, hear a student or a teacher from anywhere in the room. Um, and that's where those flex mics come in. So if you saw um, in the video, the teacher, maybe I have a photo, the teacher's wearing like a pendant, and then yeah. the students had the handheld mics, and those mics can be positioned around the room, um, and that enables not only um, uh, everyone else to hear a student voice from, from anywhere at any time, and the teacher's voice obviously to be heard through the speaker, um, but also the teacher was able to kind of listen in and eavesdrop over small group discussions, which would allow her or him to go over there and kind of intervene or, or work with those folks um, or make a comment and then kind of go over to another part of the room. So again, it, it's, it's the point is trying to provide this flexible, adaptive, and, um, and uh, equitable place where everyone can be heard and everyone's voice is heard um, in the same space. So it's really I, the mic and amp system. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, is this, I mean, so I'm assuming that this is more of a problem when you've got a bunch of group breakout groups taking place and there's actually, you know, a, a buzz in the classroom in terms of, you know, many voices speaking at low levels and trying to get above that. Is, is that the case or is this, you know, actually so that people can hear the teacher speak? Because I, I, I'm just kind of struggling with the second one. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure I understand your question, but I, I it, it's- Well, I, okay, so let me step back. I don't have any recollection of ever having trouble hearing a teacher when I was, you know, in any level of <laughs> uh, K through 12 education. I don't even remember having a problem when I went to college and I found myself in a, you know, five or 700 person seminar in an amphitheater and they didn't use any ampli amplification. So I'm struggling a little bit to understand exactly what it is that we have to do that people haven't been able to do since we had ears. I'm sorry, I'm being a little aggressive, but I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I just, I just don't, I can't picture the need for this. I mean, it was an interesting video and yes, I saw the kids speaking into it and I saw the teacher with the earphone on, but I'm kind of struggling to understand what exactly it is that they're doing that we didn't do as kids in terms of being able to communicate. I mean, if you want the teacher's attention, put your hand up, right? Yeah, and it is, a, it, I guess it, it's a more than putting your hand up. It's it's actually being able to hear your voice. And, um, and then those students who may need accommodations are often kind of more singled out because they're the one wearing the pendant versus this is a more kind of inclusive, equitable uh, approach um, that yeah. makes the makes it seamless for everyone to have the yeah, same. Lisa, if I, if I, just yeah. to chime in, you know, um, one of the things that we've really uh, gone deeply into is universal design for learning uh, in our schools. And this is a perfect example of that, as Lisa said, where it, it helps the student who needs an accommodation. It amplifies the sound to really engage students. And we know uh, how important that uh, engagement factor is for students and for, for them hearing the teacher. And, you know, uh, Brian, I guess I, I don't disagree with you, but I, I think that you know, we can't universalize that experience. Um, what I would say is that um, I've seen, you know, just from, a, from my own standpoint, many classrooms that utilize audio technology mainly because of having a student in there who may have a, an auditory um, a challenge and how much more engaging those classrooms are because of that audio component. So, you know, I, ha I have really seen that firsthand, but, um, okay. but that's really... So where it ties in. Okay, so let me see if I can summarize it. This this is really, and, and sorry for pressing on this, but I think we're actually getting to the crux of the matter now where I'm gonna to start to understand what's really happening. Um, this is really driven by special needs, the need to meet those needs, and the need to meet those needs in a way that does not shine a spotlight on that special need. That's part of it, but it does also change the model in, in of instruction where it's small group and whole group engagement is, is possible. Yeah, I mean, universal design for learning, one of the famous things about it is that one of the famous images is three students standing behind a fence, one student's um, on a very tall box, another student's on a medium sized box, and the other student's on a smaller box, and they all have the same view. But really what it is, is it's just removing the fence. So that, you know, we're just we're, we're focusing on good teaching for everyone and good right. teaching in this context helps everyone. It, it helps the student with the auditory issue, but it also helps the student that might have, be, have a little more trouble engaging than another student. Uh, and even the student who engages well, they can hear a little better. So it's a win-win for really everybody in the room. And that's just a kind of a, a, a little bit of a, um, a kind of a microcosm of things we're trying to do all over the place. Okay, that's that's helpful. I, um, I I'm starting to understand it. Um, so thank you for your your, your patience and, and for uh, for clarifying it. Um, is is there any so moving on to the next item? Is there any predisposition towards this Microsoft Surface versus just powering the system with a Chromebook like everyone else is using? So the thought here is um, to try the two in one, um, where yep. so we're trying to solve for the problem of the tethered teacher. Teachers currently have laptops. They uh, have to be wired in. So there's just kind of a number of um, opportunities here. I don't think this is the right slide. Yeah, I, I guess where I'm going is, you know, I'm, I've, two got in front of me a, I've got in front of me a, a two-in-one Chromebook, which I absolutely love, right? 
We have that on the list of four, actually. There's four possible two-in-the-one devices. There's yep. a Microsoft service, the HP Envy, uh, I think a Lenovo Chromebook, or there was definitely a Chromebook on our four, our list of four. Um, right. I, I'm just, a, I'm just, a again, I'm just, Ford version look. or a flip from a laptop to a stylus. I want, kind of wanted to try the two-in-one um, laptop to a stylus. To move. Okay. Look, I, I love all those ideas. I don't love the idea of getting a different um, operating system into our environment. It creates a lot of maintenance issues and compatibility yeah, issues. The, our teachers already have PC laptops with Windows. They already have them. So this wouldn't be a leap as far as an operating system for our teachers. Any other questions, Brian? Nope. Uh, Mike? Um, unfortunately, I have a raft of questions and I wonder if we might, maybe I can meet with Lisa and others on the school liaison group or I could go through them, but I've got a bunch. I'm, I'm very concerned about this. Um, and I'm looking at it not so much from the tactical and is a LCD projector compared to a, a, a display screen. I really don't care at this point. Yeah. What I do care about is the outlay um, for the town for this kind of massive upgrade. Even though it's a pilot, if the pilot succeeds, then I imagine the school department is going to want to deploy across the district. So I have a number of questions that go to the concept and the strategy and the wisdom in it. Do you, just to be you, right think, up. you think it would be more efficient for you to deal directly with Lisa on this or? I think it I think so, but um, I'm happy to go through these questions. I can, I'll just run them down. And if you folks feel like, you know, Mike, that's, you're asking so much of us, let's take that offline. I'm happy to do that. I want to be respectful well, we've of got, everybody. We've got time. We don't. I, I actually don't have time. I have to teach a class at 8 p.m. I apologize, but I have a class to teach at 8. Yeah, so I've got 13 minutes. I don't think that's right. Um, and it's disappointing that, um, we scheduled it tonight when you've got a limit of an hour for. Well, for yeah, I was minute. told it would only take twenty minutes, but. Uh, well, it did. <laughs> I mean, it was yeah, twenty yeah. minutes. In fairness, quickly in goes sorry, into but, an hour for us. Okay, well, let me give you some of the concepts so that you're not um, surprised anymore. Um, first, for for Superintendent Sullivan, um, how often do these ed tech models change how often will you be coming back to us saying you know what we're going to retire the old way of doing things and go to the classroom of the future and we hear that every time there's a request um that's well, one big question i'm not asking for an answer now but these are my concerns okay. how often do we do these generational what i would think of going up a generation in technology hardware software um, what is your definition of success? What metrics have you planned to tell you whether or not these um, ideas are going to help the town spend its money wisely, balanced against the needs, needs of, of your students? You know, you need to be able to demonstrate from this pilot what, whether or not you've achieved success. It's, to me, it's more than just testing out different types of technology. It's testing out this model. Yeah. And how that's going to help us as the town's capital budget committee convince the town that this is a good spend. Um, how much of this effort is focused on remote learning? You had, you had alluded to that earlier. Um, but the pictures I saw were all in classroom. Um, how much lift will you get in your education to justify the spend? Can you quantify that? In increased test scores, um, definitions of success for your students. Um, what is the adoption rate for untethered teacher 
uh, the untethered teacher concept? Is this widely accepted? Is this, and I just don't know, is this a standard that um, school systems are now following? Or is this something new that you wanna try out? Um, hardware, software, network upgrades. What changes will we have to manage and the cost entail for deploying this idea across the district? Teacher training, are there bonuses attached to this for certification in this style of teaching? Um, what is the deployment or what could the deployment cost us um, to the classrooms beyond the pilot classrooms? Um, those are my, those are my uh, main points that I, I'm very concerned about. So I'm not expecting you to answer all th them in 10 minutes. And I'm more than happy to sit down with, um, with others on this committee, um, including our liaisons, Brian and, and Francine, um, and go through this and with, with the superintendent and yourself, Lisa, um, and, and help us really understand whether this is going to be worth it. Yeah, Capital, I, mean, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think we're probably wise not to try to answer all those tonight. We're gonna run out of time. Um, and I had a, a number of questions uh, that probably are on the same somewhat of the same vein. I, I wanted to know why we're choosing four classrooms. What would the total cost of this project be to the whole district, assuming yep. we went ahead with it? Um, what, what do we do if this pilot doesn't work? If it's, if it's deemed that it's not worthwhile? And what happens in the district if capital budget decides they can't fund this this year. Um, so those are some questions I have, you know, sort of from a longer term standpoint. But I don't want to spend, I know we have the town hall people waiting. We're already gone over our time. So what I'd like to do, if it's all right with everybody is to reschedule this and pick it back up again, either next week or the week after. I would appreciate that, Sam. Yeah, I, well, I think- I would appreciate knowing the questions ahead of yeah, time so that Pat and I can take a look and see if there's um, you know, some clarifications I can provide. Sure. Even yeah, I'd be also happy to, to you know, articulate I think those concerns for you. Yeah. I think that'd be great to have the questions ahead of time. I think there's also a point where we've kind of delivered what we have and answered the questions. I don't think we're there yet. I think they, you know, there's some good questions there, but I don't know, you know, we can we can kind of keep keep beating at this. Um, we're really looking for some foundational money to uh, try some things that we're definitely going to explore in the district because these are not new things. Um, we're way behind. And uh, these are um, definitely tried and true methods of increasing student engagement, uh, increasing, increasing ways uh, that students can redefine learning. And, um, you know, I think the, the presentation was really intelligible about those uh, purposes. And, um, you know, there's a point where we feel like we've sort of presented what we have here and we respect your role and, and your right to, to kind of make decisions regarding that. But if you want to give us the questions ahead of time, I, I don't, I mean, we've already, we've already taken up a lot of your time uh, with our, you know, coming to the Capitol. I think this is our third time now. And I know this is specifically about the, um, the pilot, but uh, you know, I would, I would think we'd be able to answer the questions and then maybe we can determine as a group, if it's going to be profitable to have us back. Okay. Would, would it be helpful to you if we put our remaining questions in writing? Yes. I'll send them to you. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. always really helpful. I'll send over the. Okay, I mean, I'll that would the slide then you could well. prepare yourselves. And when we get back together, or maybe you can just respond to us in writing. Maybe that would work. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, it could be, it, it could be this further clarification, but we might just be able to at least give what we have in writing. Um, and that might actually uh, go deep, deeply enough. But you'd be able to look at that and decide. Okay. Why don't we plan on that then? And um, we're gonna try to move on to town hall. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you very well, much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Lisa, have a good Lisa, Take and, care. Bye. Bye thank you very much. Appreciate your Bye. time. Thank, thank you. you. Michelle, do we know if anybody from Town Hall is waiting? They're all here. Let me get them in. Okay. <laughs> Sorry we took so long. Okay. It just takes a minute for me to get everybody in. Understand. Um, And just so you know, Don is here. He's an attendee. He's working on something. So if we need him, I'll promote him in. But um, he is listening. Is Don. Oh, Don Piat. Hi. Yep. He's Hi. he's in. But I'll promote okay. him if we have any questions. Hi, Phil. As soon as everybody gets on, why don't you go ahead? Hey, Sam. Sure. All right. Hey, Francine, it's Mike. Um, I'm not finding my um, mute on my screen. Am I locked out? Just want to be able to mute. Um, I can... No, I want to be able to mute so that... You should be in the lower left-hand corner, Mike. Oh, you, you are. You're mute. So, Mike, are you all set? Did you find it? Because I just muted you. No, but it, it, it's not visible in the normal place. I'm oh, not seeing okay. It. All I can do is pin and nothing else. Oh. Not sure. well, just be quiet. Do you, do you want me to mute you or are you okay? Yeah, I will. I'm fine. I'll be okay. quiet. I'll be quiet. <laughs> People will like that. Uh, Phil, I think the objective of this is to try to bring us up to speed on um, what's happening with Town Hall, what some of the potential costs might be. I realize you haven't gotten anything finalized and everything's sort of flying around in estimates at this point, but <clears throat> it's probably a good time to start getting this committee in the loop. Sure. Well, thank you for having us. <clears throat> we have uh, Mark Cameron and uh, Carolyn Coffey from our uh, uh, committee. And we also have John Lemieux and Steve Kirby from uh, our project management group. So we have a uh, PowerPoint presentation that we're gonna do and that's where we're gonna uh, you know, convey all the information that we have at this point for you to uh, take a look at. So uh, I think John needs to have a screen share and we can get started unless there's something else we need to cover first. There we go. <clears throat> so Mark is gonna take the first uh, screen. I'm gonna take the second batch and then John is gonna continue with the rest of the presentation. All right, so, so the, all, the, the uh, the main question is why are we here? Um, a lot of these studies and data uh, goes back to the uh, 2018 uh, endeavor, but we're, we're faced with uh, many um, systems, uh, mechanical systems uh, and so forth that both in the historic and in the annex that are both deteriorating and at the end of their um, calculated usable life, um, the exterior envelope uh, especially in the historical building going in there, a lot of windows in disrepair uh, due to age, uh, sheathing in, in difficult shape, rot that was observed during the painting um, work that was recently done about a year ago, uh, a roof that is um, pending uh, needing replacement, um, a lot of areas of, of the historical town, uh, not a lot, but areas of the historical town hall are not accessible. So one of the objectives of this project was to make all of 
the building accessible, uh, bathroom upgrades and inadequate meeting space. This was part of the charge by, set forth by the uh, Board of Select. Couldn't find my mute button. Um, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> this is a, a rendering of the addition. Um, you can see it is on the same size as side as the annex right now. Um, and you'll see it has a side entrance as opposed to a front or a rear entrance where people from the parking lot will naturally go into it. Um, and it complements the old historic building without copying it exactly. Um, very similar lines, but not quite as extravagant. Uh, somewhat simplified, but still, still has that uh, you know historic touch to it. Um, so we were charged with with goals, um, and these are some of the goals listed here that we've accomplished. Um, we were supposed to have a, an efficient, functional floor plan that allows for change and growth. The uh, the two floors are concrete floors, and there's only two columns that support those floors. <clears throat> so if down the road 20 or 30 years from now, uh, the uh, offices had to change, um, the, the partitions between the offices could be removed and the design interior could be changed around to accommodate um, some changes in, in requirement for, for the functions of the uh, offices. <clears throat> Uh, appropriately accessible entrances and public offices. Um, so on the first floor, we have what the public would um, generally uh, do the transaction, the, uh, the clerk, collector, building commissioner, board of health, um, and permitting would be, would be there on the first floor. And if you walk in, it's a vestibule style. So you'll see all of these offices to either side of you and you walk, look straight ahead, you'll be looking at the elevator for the second floor and right into the old town hall. So it's a very, very easy to um, navigate space, unlike what is there today. Um, also asked to have sufficient meeting room space for public and staff. So we have a very small meeting room, uh, flex space on the first floor and then meeting space on the second floor of the addition um, for a little bit larger um, meetings. Um, but we have taken the opportunity to use Old Town Hall, um, you know, the big room for any large meetings. So the idea is to, to set that up so that if there were meetings of excessive size, we wouldn't have to have a, a separate meeting room. In the addition for that, we could just move that large group to that hall. And again, the attractive design complementing historic building in the common. Uh, I think the design team did a, did a really nice job um, coming up with that, with that rendering that you saw. <clears throat> um, and again, these are, these are starts of it. They aren't really specific, but they give a, a good idea of the, uh, the size, the direction, the entrance, um, you know, and, and what, what it's going to look at. Um, John Lemieux is going to take over now and do the presentation. Thanks, Phil. Again, my name is John Lemieux with Vertex. Uh, happy to be here with you uh, this evening. Just a brief background. I've been with Vertex for over 20 years and have been in the construction industry for about 28. And about the, for the last 12 or so years, I've been working solely as an owner's project manager on um, municipal projects, public projects. Uh, currently, we have projects in our portfolio um, between 3 million and 150 million. And I wanted to just talk to you a little bit today about uh, the total project budget, um, how we arrived at it, and also let you know about the things that are still being developed. I mean, just understand that we are just at the schematic design level of things here, and that's what this estimate is. So if you kind of were to look at this as a, as a progress bar, where zero is starting, you know, at the very beginning, and 100% is when you're going out to bid with a design, we're somewhere between 15 to 20% right now, probably even closer to 15 um, so when we talk about a total project budget, um, there's various costs that make up that total project budget. 
you've got your hard costs, which are really just construction costs, the labor, equipment, and materials that go into the project. Soft costs are kind of everything else, you know, your architect and engineer fees, your fees for your OPM, as well as your furniture, fixture, and equipment. Basically, if you picked up the building and shook it, everything that fell out of the building would be, you know, kind of fall under that FF&E category, um, as well as, you know, technology, uh, loose technology like computers and those sorts of things. And then contingencies. Contingencies are the rainy day fund um, that you have that you have to budget for um, so that we don't have to go back to a town meeting and ask for. And the hope is that you don't, you know, use it all. Um, the reality, though, is, is when you do a historical renovation, um, you know, there's a typically a slightly higher contingency you would carry than if it were all a brand new building. And I'll get into that now. So um, basically here you have the total project budget, again, broken into those categories, hard costs, soft costs, and contingencies. Um, the construction costs are broken out into a, basically different HVAC systems. So the construction costs, as you can see in the first line, all track the same way. Um, but we wanted to, the committee wanted to get some pricing for the different options of uh, HVAC systems. Um, kind of the, the base system was a variable air volume system. The option one is a variable refrigerant flow with outside air. And option two is the add to do the, uh, basically the VRF system, but using geothermal. And I've got, we'll have some other comments about geothermal after. Um, but as you can see, the soft costs um, increase slightly um, with the increase in construction costs. You can see the other costs broken out below. Um, and then the contingencies, there's a 10% contingency on hard costs and a 5% soft cost contingency um, for all of, all of those items. So basically we end up with a total project budget between 13.5 and 14.2 million. Um, basically, you know, with the design team, the recommended option um, for the town would be option one. And if the geothermal um, uh, upgrade was uh, interesting to the town, it would go up to 14.2. But to go along kind of with what Phil was saying, some things that came out of the looking at the schematic design is, you know, for the program that was looked at, um, you know, this is not a $10 million project. I know there was a lot of hope that this would be a $10 million project, but to remove the annex, to rebuild it and to program it with the space that was necessary, um, it just, it, the numbers just do not work to 10. They work to 13 to 14. Um, and the project cost is largely driven by that program. Um, you know, square footage equals cost. Um, the square, uh, this is a schematic design cost estimate. Again, it's high level. Um, specific design details would come next in the various, uh, in the future design phases, design development, construction documents. You would get a couple more, um, you would get a couple more uh, go, uh, go arounds at the uh, estimate as the design progressed. Also, the design is no frills. This is a solid 50 year plus design. Um, you know, usually we, you hear a lot in, when you talk about public co uh, projects, you know, it, it's a Taj Mahal. No, it's not a Taj Mahal, but it is solid. You know, at the end of the day, we want something that's going to last that years into this, you know, you're not questioning, well, why did they build it with this material? You know, public buildings are well-used uh, well structures. When we get, when we talk about the geothermal aspects of the, of the project, still being reviewed. I know that um, there was some feedback right away that the, you know, that up, up charge for the geothermal seemed high. We have not looked any further into that at this point. That would come next in the next phase of design. Um, you know, what type of geothermal system, you know, the estimated construction costs, the uh, ROI for, for going with a system like that, and obviously the increases to design and other construction costs if, if we moved ahead with that. So again, the geothermal piece, um, you know, that would be obviously much more studied uh, in the next phase of design. Also, there's still some unknowns, you know, temporary facilities. If the entire project is undertaken, uh, basically, Town, hall, town Hall's residents have to move. Um, they have to move somewhere for a, a period of time. You know, you know, right now there would be, uh, you know, where would we put some trailers or some temporary facilities? Um, hopefully it would be on town-owned land so there would be no lease or, or purchase uh, of anything required. 
um, and that would be the plan. You know, what's needed for utilities to, you know, make that place, that temporary facility live. What kind of accessibility requirements are we going to have? What kind of fire alarm and fire protection systems will be required by code or the building officials? What are we going to have to do for COVID? Um, are we still going to be in, the, in that situation? Um, and then securing access control. Obviously, too, a, a driver of this is how long are we going to be there? Is this a 12-month duration, a 14-month duration, 15 months? Again, you learn more of that as the design uh, moves ahead. But again, we carried a, a baseline of uh, 12 months in this, and um, the temporary facilities cost would be around a quarter of a million dollars um, for that total project budget we showed you. And then also some other things that affect the cost of public work. Um, prevailing wage, you know, as an example, we are currently working on the Situate Senior Center that is just finishing up uh, down the road. Um, these are the rates for the trades um, before markups right now. So as you can see, you have, you know, everything from a, a laborer at $60 an hour uh, up to a, a high of an elevator uh, tech at, at $98 an hour. And onto those rates, you put 30% labor burden, overhead and profit, insurance and bond costs. So as an example, on an average $88 an hour labor rate, um, it's $117 an hour cost um, you know, to the project. And then also too, we talk about escalation. Uh, escalation is another driver, of course, you know, because labor and materials are always going up. Um, you may have heard recently, costs of uh, lumber products are skyrocketing all of a sudden. Um, you know, just before COVID hit, the construction market had seen a couple of years of about 5% a year escalation. So just as an example, you know, what does that mean? You know, using that 14.2 number from the beginning, you know, if you at 2%, you wait, you know, three years, it goes up to 15 million. It goes up a million dollars. If we experience, a, you know, a, a building boom at the end of COVID, you know, a year could cost, you know, 700,000 and up. Um, for each year, you know, after, after year zero. So again, just something to keep, uh, keep in mind, you know, labor never goes down, you know, so it's always something that will cost more later um, than it would today. So we per, uh, performed a couple of um, presentations for the select board and, you know, kind of wrapping up here, this was, you know, where the building committee landed, um, basically, and the select board uh, supported um, moving ahead, going to the Springtown meeting of this year with an ask for additional design fees to basically take the design all the way um, to construction. Uh, and that's kind of represented by, the, uh, by this rectangle here. Why the, the two options we're showing though is when we would come back for and how we would come back for construction dollars. So you would either come back in the fall of 21 using an estimate, an estimated construction amount, and then ask the town for that ask for the uh, remaining dollars in the project to build it. And then that project would be bid in spring of 22. Um, option B would be to uh, not come back to the town until the spring of 22. Um, and that would be with bids in hand. Obviously there's time to figure that out. Um, the selectmen agreed there would be time to figure that out, um, but we're very supportive of, of the, um, the ask for design fees uh, at this upcoming town meeting. So, you know, basically that would uh, provide for design development, construction documents and bidding, uh, and then, you know, kind of take us all the way through uh, the bid of the project. But, you know, based on that, um, so, since then, I should say, uh, there's been some feedback to some members of the building committee, um, you know, a, a possibly needing to be an alternative option. Uh, and basically, if the project wasn't financially feasible in one phase, is in do it all at once, uh, we could explore the option of, again, designing the project right now and only look to do construction, we'll call it phase one, renovation of the old town hall and preparing the mechanical, electrical, plumbing and fire protection for phase two. So basically getting the systems ready for the building to do that phase two work at some point in the future. Obviously that hasn't been studied, hasn't been, um, hasn't been designed, uh, but it is certainly something that could be looked at in this next phase, um, next phase of design. Um, 
you know, exactly what that looks like. Again, not really sure. But if, if you know, if, if that was the will of the a town, of course, we could, you know, we could look at that. So, and again, that's really just, that's come up subsequent to the, the two. So with that, um, that's all I have for presentation. And open it to any questions you have. Hey, Sam, that's our presentation. If you want to open it up to questions. Okay. Capital, anybody have any questions? Well, I, you know, there, I'm, I'm sure there are many, many questions. Let me ask the, obvi the obvious one, which is if, if the selectmen two years ago promised the voters that they would try to fund this out of the operating budget and they would come in at roughly nine million, which if I remember correctly is what uh, Kevin McCarthy recommended, how does this fit with what the commitment was and what really was a major commitment but does not seem to be in the, the criteria by which you actually design this building? And I do think um, many people, including myself, are very concerned um, broadly about the impact of this on the town and the fact that even without this, we're going to have difficulty funding all of the things that people want to do without overrides or exclu excluded debt, whichever you want to call it. Um, and so I guess the question is, is this breaking faith with the town when you say we wanted to come in and make this work under the operating budget, but now we know almost surely it cannot do that. And so we're going to go back to the town. This is the third or fourth time to try to get an, a first a town meeting vote and then finally a, a ballot vote to, su to succeed. This makes it very difficult to do it when in fact people think some faith has been broken here. So I pose that to you, I, but I will say also, I think this is a very good design. I like it far better than the previous one. I do think the idea of the vestibule or whatever you want to call it, the entry, it makes sense to me. Um, many aspects of this do make sense to me. It's just this cost based on all of the other expenses for which we do not even now have the money. Um, and if you heard the presentation preceding this, another million dollars for just technology for the schools, and that's probably just the beginning. Um, we're really up, up against it in many ways and being able to afford what we're talking about. So, and then many other things other people will bring up and I could bring them up. I don't do that. I don't need to do that now. Um, so I think you've done a very good job. I appreciate the, the presentation. I really do. I do think it's a good design. It really comes down to will people pay more money for this, and I guess maybe the only other thing is, did, was anybody, was, was any consideration given to the fact that work is changing in the United States so that more remote work, and certainly rem remote meetings as is this one, are where people are going insofar as they can? And is that a consideration here? And does that affect the actual amount of space you really need? So that's a lot of things, um, but it's an opinion and also some thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, Susan, do you have any questions? Uh, I, I too appreciate the uh, presentation. I, I really haven't uh, heard much about what's been going on, so I appreciate that all that work that's been done. Um, I, I, like Ralph, I have I have a lot of questions. It's the first time I'm, I'm digesting the material. Um, I do agree in principle with with Ralph's. Um, you know, approach that it's it's a big pill to swallow, and it, it's going to have you're going to be very careful about how it's presented to the town. And that did bring me to my one question uh, that popped off the slide for me was was when you came up with the ulterior but the uh, alternative plan. Uh, the phase one is to renovate Old Town Hall first instead of instead of the annex. And is that, is that more because it's not feasible to do it the other way? Uh, Cause it seems to me that if the offices are gonna be in the annex and the old town hall is primarily uh, meeting space and, oh, and <laughs> community space, it seems to be backward to solving the problem that we seem to be faced with and that we need a place for our, our town workers to work. Phil, do you want to take a shot at that or? 
I, I, I can take a shot at it just from a from a technical standpoint. Okay, John. Um, I think the the design, which you know, just showing you a few pictures, doesn't kind of show you the layout. There's a lot more office space going into the old town hall now, and that's that's part of the design to try to utilize a lot more of that space. And I think part of the strategy of doing the old town hall first is because of the availability of CPC funding under you know, under the historical piece. If you do the new piece first, there is no historical, there is no CPC money available because you're not renovating an old, you're, you're demoing and building a new. So I think some of the strategy was hearing some of the concerns about, um, you know, funding and all that, you know, trying to use that CPC bucket if you could, um, and then, you know, worry about phase two later. But again, that we are just scratching the surface with that, with some of that. I mean, clearly we would look at both um, and see the impact of both, um, but that's, uh, it's, it's certainly a good question. And, and just uh, if add, you broke add, it into two uh, phases, that would most likely increase the cost quite a bit? Without question. The devil's in the details, Sam, because- Yeah, I know. How, how, long, how long do you wait, you know? I've got a story of a, of a fire station on Nantucket that, you know, they could have built, you know, for $8 million and they waited seven years and it cost them 20, you know, attached to their police station. Yeah. I mean, and it's the same darn design that they had originally. So, you know, it's the same thing, same thing here, you know, even if it's just a modest two to 3% a year yeah. in five years, that's 15 to 20%, depending on how it's compounded. So, um, you know, how you cut it, where you draw the line, what you do in the, with one half of the project versus the other. Yes, cutting it into two will always cost you more. The question is, is can you do it strategically enough so that you don't waste money now and like say put, you know, we're gonna do the old and we're gonna put all new windows in the annex. Well, yeah, at some point in the near future, you're gonna tear that down and you're gonna waste the money on those windows, but you might need windows right now. So. Those are the kind of things you would talk about and think through so that you're waste, you know, yeah. you are, you're wasting, you know, a, a certain amount of money. So if you, you know, the cleaner the demising line, um, you know, the better, the better it is for the town. Brian, do you have any questions? I, I have a few. Um, first, a comment. I'm not at all a fan of um, splitting the project into um, two, two phases. Um, I mean, there are other reasons you might split the buildings, but that's not what's on the table here. Um, splitting this into, you know, into two project phases, you know, doubles the disruption to our town hall employees, um, increases the price, um, frankly, probably compromises the finished product. I'm just, I'm not a fan. Um, I, there, you know, there was another direction that, you know, I know um, at various points was, was socialized amongst the, uh, the building committee, um, Phil and Mark, about, you know, what, what do we do? What do you do? Uh, but if the price comes in at a level that's, you know, that's, that's not supportable. Um, and I know that your committee had some ideas. I know I shared some ideas. Um, are those levers being discussed? And if so, you know, what's on the table and what does it entail? So I think just to, to speak to that, we, you know, we've, we've heard, um, some feedback on, on is this particular space needed? Is there uh, certain square footage efficiencies that can be implemented? Is that, is that kind of the, the, uh, the basis of, of where that was, was going? Um, and yeah, I think I, I, I'll just be blunt, right? I'm, um, you know, Phil threw out at one point, you know, that there was some, you know, some, some conversation that, well, maybe we cut out the big conference room, right? Um, I had thrown out you know, a slightly different observation, which is you don't need to cut it out, you know, put it where it is now, which is in the basement, because right now the basement's, you know, basically not terribly um, high efficiency <laughs> partitions, let's put it that way. Uh, there's a lot of square footage down there. Somehow we've lost the big conference room and there's not really any functionality that's gone in there versus what's, you know, what's in our town hall now. So, there's plenty of room down there for the, you know, for a massive conference room. You know, you bump the treasure collector up to the second floor, you know, maybe instead of safe harbor and, you know, reduce the size of the annex. It's all a square footage 
you know, this is the, as, as, as John stated, right? The cost is driven by the square footage. The square footage was set the moment the first floor programming was set. The basement and the second floor fell out of that, and as did the cost for the total project. So, you know, if, if, if you want to pull a lever, that seems to me the only lever you can pull. And I'm not counting the table right. that you do it, but I'm wondering if that's something that's being discussed and being considered. Well, it has, and, and it has been looked at. And, you know, again, it's uh, one of the items is what, it, what are we, what are, is the, is the juice worth the squeeze there? Are we going to get correct? Are, are we going to, if we go down 500 square feet, are we going to spend, how much money are we going to spend in design costs now to redesign the building to make it right. work so, program wise? It, every, right. every time we were doing that, it felt like that's where we were getting hung up. Now we're going to be in a major redesign to, to remove 500 square feet of, of uh, okay, so so my question specifically: Has someone on the back of an envelope worked through that math? Because at the end of the day, we're just all about cost benefit. I mean, your arguments are all spot on, but has someone on the back of an envelope done that math? Yeah, I think from a rough standpoint, Brian. You know, because yep. as an example, you know, let's say we're talking about five fifty a square foot right now, five sixty. Yep. You take out 500 square feet, you're not saving 560. You're probably right, but it's five, save. but it's but but it's 500 bucks per th on each of three floors. It's it's 1500 square feet. Yeah, right? I mean, I, At, I was using 600, right? It's it's whatever, three quarters to a million bucks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it so a couple of questions there, I guess. Let's say the answer to that question was yes, I'll play devil's advocate for a minute. Yep. If this if this project came back to the to to this group right now and said, "Hey, we saved seven fifty, and now we're at thirteen point one," is suddenly this group saying, "Hey, great," or is it, "No, this job has to be eleven or 10. So I think that kind of reflects a little bit of what Mark was saying. We talk about the squeeze. Yeah, we could work to we could work to cut a million bucks out of this thing, but the the you know, but it would be painful, you know, because you know, as Phil said in the beginning. It's a pretty efficient design, I think. I agree. You know, we, we, we could nip and tuck, but I think at the end of the day, does it, again, it's the cost benefit, but, you know, um, there hasn't, you know, again, the part B of your question, you know, it's been, it's been done, but it really hasn't, you know, select board like this design said, yes, you know, go ahead, you know, this group is a lot more hesitant to this design and, and the price associated with it. So the committee's got some, got some dis discussing to do of kind of what's next, you know, what the next piece is. And I don't think that's taken place yet fully. Yeah. Look, let me be blunt. The select board wants a new town hall. Uh, and I agree with them. Um, it's our job to make sure that the money is spent efficiently. Um, and it feels to me as though, you know, we're spending somewhere between three quarters of a million and a million bucks to move a function from the second floor to the first floor, which I agree is functionally better, but has been done differently for the past 40 years. So it's kind of a need, not a want. I'm sorry, it's a want, not a need. Um, just, you know, I, and I, I, think, I think it would be helpful for someone to actually look at the square footage of that, that office and put a number on it and say, this is what you'd save if you moved it and you choose. Could, could I make a suggestion here? Um, I don't think the purpose of this at this point is to get into the nitty gritty of what's where, uh, move this up to the second floor or reduce that space. I think the place for that would be at a town hall building committee meeting uh, where that could be input. Um, so I, I appreciate your concern, and, but we could spend all night right now getting ourselves educated on why this function was put here and how much space it needed. Um, and I'm not sure that's going to solve anything at this point. I'd like to sort of get through everybody on capital budget to see if you have any big higher level questions and then we'll go from there. And if we need to get back with the town hall building committee, we can do that. 
Is that agreeable? Yeah. Sam, I'm going to defer to you. Okay. <laughs> I know you're not happy because you want to get into more, but uh, I, I look I, without. It, it, it's not about the design, okay? It's about you know each room in this building being larger than a typical capital request. Yeah, I understand. Each room, thing. right? So you know we're, we're we're looking at a picture of an exterior of a building, which I want to be completely clear is a beautiful design, and I'm I would actually factor not messing with it, right? To save a few dollars, just to be completely clear, to you know to fill the mark and to you know, John and Steve, it's, it's not my instinct to go, you know, sort of bastardize what is candidly a beautiful piece of work. Um, and, you know, sadly, you know, we, we, we haven't seen the interior as a committee, um, but I will say I'm equally impressed by the work that the architect has done, you know, on the interior of this building. Um, and I, you know, I think at some point people are going to want to see that. Um, but, you know, there are a series of decisions that have been made that led to the cost point. And I think people need to understand what those are. And, yep. you know, right now we're flying blind. Mike Dick, do you have any questions? Um, I have a comment or two. Okay. First, I agree with what uh, my colleagues on the board have been saying so far. Um, I am very concerned with the price and the political will to pass the funding for this number. The intent two, three years ago was to come in much, much less than the number you've come in at. And my take on the situation is you folks really should be looking at a way to bring it in at a number that is acceptable to the town and to the people who will vote on it. And my particular feeling right now is that number is far too high. And I, I have no intention of getting into how you can cut the costs. But my comment is you somehow have to consider coming in at a number much lower than 12, coming in at that 10. And if that means back to the drawing board, if that means going back to Chris Sr. and saying, we're not going to have as many uh, rooms, um, we're not gonna have a, a studio for 143, in order to make this palatable, this project acceptable to the voters. That's a reality. I'm also somewhat concerned to hear that, well, we don't really have a choice now because in terms of the square footage, because there, there have been commitments made. Maybe I misunderstood that piece of it, but it sounded to me like, you know, we can't, we can't really change it now. It's, it's too late. And that worries me. So that's my reaction at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Francine? Um, I do. I, I think I have some big picture question, a uh, big pic picture question. Um, and that is since it is, uh, in the historic district on the National Register. Have you hired or has there been hired a preservationist to review uh, the design so that it stays within the historic um, framework? And is CPC money, I think you mentioned as a possibility, is that gonna be a requirement of CPC that there is a historic expert that's overseeing this as well? So Francine, I don't think that, you know, haven't delved that far into the historic um, details of this yet because it's all still very schematic. You know, that, that kind of goes into the next, the next phase. You know, what are we doing with the windows? You know, can we put, you know, do they have, can they be metal windows or do they have to be wooden? You know, all of those things would kind of happen next. Um, Johnson Roberts is well aware of the, the district it's in. Uh, and those things would all be, you know, kind of addressed as in, into the next, the next phases of the, of the process. So that's a, that's a little bit of a concern for me only because um, what I do is historic preservation for um, non-tax exempt entities mm -hmm. and the historic component um, from a finance perspective, I'm not a builder in the construction side, but from a finance perspective, 
Um, the cost for preservation can be so much more for the windows and trim and paint color. All, all of those things can really drive up the price in order to stay, you know, compliant, if you will, with the National Register and the fact that it's in the historic district. So I just want to raise that now because folks are talking about the cost, but like I say, doing what I do, I know the fact that it's an historic um, district and there may be things you have to do for that um, to make it compliant or keep it compliant could really raise the cost. Anything else? That's all, that's all I had, I'm just curious. Okay. Bill, do you have any? You still here? I'm still here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Everything moves around. Did you have anything else you wanted to tell the capital budget? No, I don't think so. I mean, this is the first go around, um, yeah. showing what we've been charged with, and uh, you know the the particulars that we've been asked to um, put in um, old town hall and, and new town hall. Yeah. Um, uh, you know that there's probably a lot of comments to come up, but I, I think I think you're probably right. Uh, some of this discussion should happen at our committee meetings and not here. Yeah, Phil, just one just one question, comment for from Mike. Mike, yeah, I don't want you to think that the pro, the program drives the square footage. It doesn't mean the program's locked, but you know the designer's understanding of what the program is for right now. You know the the accountant needs X square feet. You know the treasurer needs Y square feet. Those things added together come up with the total. The total times you know the square foot price is the is the value. So you know those things you know at first run through of all of that programming. You know that's the equation that you have now. Doesn't mean it can't change, but obviously you also can't fit everybody in that building. You know you can't just say okay everyone gets half the space because some of those spaces are pretty efficient and pretty small. So you know the next piece of that is if if you want to reduce, you could certainly reduce program, but that may mean some people who live in that building may have to live somewhere else. And, you know, those, mm -hmm. those are the pieces that, you know, that hasn't, that hasn't been gone through at this point. And I think that would be a useful exercise to be, honest, <laughs> to be very honest with you. Well, I know one comment I have having been to a number of the town hall building committee meetings is that it seems every time we turn around a new function gets added into town hall we have tv 143 we have safe harbor we have emergency management now needs an office and we're we're growing our need so and i think the biggest question we're going to have to figure out is how do we finance this whole thing you know, and that's going to take a significant amount of work, especially if we're going to keep it totally within the operating budget. It's going to mean a lot of future capital projects are going to have to be pushed off. Right. So that's my initial reaction. If anybody else had any comments. No, thank you. I, I just look, I'd like yeah. to just. I would like to just take a moment and, and thank Phil and Mark and the entire town hall building committee. Um, I'd ask, ask you to extend the thanks to the architect and I certainly want to thank the OPMs as well. There's zero question in my mind that this is an infinitely more attractive building um, and an infinitely more functional interior design um, than what we had in front of us three years ago. Um, and uh, you know, I'm just extraordinarily happy with sort of the, you know, the evolution of the team and the project and, and, and where it is. Um, the frustration you sense in my voice is, is really just driven by the price tag. Um, and, you know, it feels a little bit as though, you know, perhaps the, the cost guidance, you know, never perhaps was articulated clearly to the committee by you know, the, by the Board of Selectmen. Um, and, and, you know, we designed a beautiful building and it came out in a different price. Um, and that's, that's where we are. And the question now is, what do we do? So 
I, I just, you know, that, that's the issue in my mind. I, I want to be really clear. This isn't criticism of anyone's work. It's beautiful work. Thanks, Brian. Michelle, you have a comment or question or whatever. I, ha I have a question, actually. So um, in many instances, we talk about this $10 million figure fitting in the operating budget. I, I know we've seen some modeling. Does $10 million actually fit in the operating budget or is that just an arbitrary number we're using? Is the number that actually fits $8 million, $9 million? I, I just, we keep throwing around this number 10 million and I understand why we keep discussing it because it was the number that was given to us by Kevin McCarthy a couple of years ago. But I just would really like to understand, does 10 million fit into the operating budget? Or if we, if we do decide to have some swing space, have people move to other buildings and $10 million is the number, is that gonna work? So I just, I just wanna, you know, See where we're going that. That's a good point, Michelle. Is, is Don online? Can he answer that? Don is in. We think Don, there he is. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I, I'd have to say that's a bit of a loaded question. Um, I, I mean, it can, right? I mean, you, I think you, your whole committee has seen the capital stabilization analysis, and I know there's some work to do on that. And, and again, what, what you've seen are just um, high level assumptions um, and things that may not even really fit in there or be approved by you folks. It was more of a planning tool. Uh, when you look in there, I mean, it does, if you even bond just a number that I have in there now is $6 million for, for town hall. Again, that was... Back when we were talking about 10 million, less maybe four from CPC is where the six comes from. That's about, you know, very conservatively at 4% over 20 years, I think the number is 440 a year. And, and as you can see from that, that analysis, I mean, uh, in future years, you really squeeze out your availability to fund other bigger projects or other projects in general. Um, now, is there some getting around that? Can we use some more free cash? Can we do some other things? Maybe, but to just say that it can fit within the operating budget, I, I don't know if we're there. Um, and again, I think that's it's not my decision to make clearly. That's um, my opinion right now uh, that are the existing model, what we existingly have as an annual appropriation in a capital and just seeing what the 10 year capital plan is Again, the 10 year plan is based on departmental submission. So are they need versus want versus find the sky dream? You know, that, that's for us to kind of go through annually and, and really weed that out. But, you know, I'm seeing 4 million a year, at least I think in the first three or four, Michelle, if I'm right. Uh, one year is 15, again, because discussion of the public safety building. I mean, there are some huge items right. in the 10 year plan. And, and we're, we're just, we've been really getting, getting the departments to think long-term. So I would think really the first five years of that 10 uh, may be realistic. And then, you know, the out years, uh, probably half the stuff, uh, we're probably missing half the stuff <laughs> that should be on there in the out year. So uh, I, it's a bit of a loaded question. I, I don't know if it necessarily fit, um, but it definitely does squeeze out our opportunities in the future for other projects. Well, I think it would take some hard analysis to figure out how you could make it fit and what you would have to forego uh, if you went ahead and did it. I mean, I ran a, a, a debt service projection of 10 million at 3%, which may be low, but that gives you just under 700,000 a year of debt service. And this was over a 20 year period. Right. So I guess one option is possibly to not do it within the operating budget, but not have it included as part of the capital stabilization fund. And, and fund 700,000 additionally in our operating budget? Yeah. 
but not have it included within the capital stabilization fund so it didn't affect your ability to provide capital items for everybody. Right. Just a thought, and we probably won't solve it tonight here. But, but it underscores the need to, for us on the capital budget with Don, um, to come up with some guidelines for, for Phil and, uh, and his team so that they really know what they're up against. Yeah. And I, I think that's also part of the calculation, perhaps with the select board, is to, to really assess, if not survey, what the town might go for in terms of, and I'll use the term override, and no one gets mad, but a tax increase. How much? And if we can come to a meeting of the minds with the finance side saying, this is what we're going to need to pull this off. And whoever's helping with the political calculation, getting out in front of the voters and starting a, um, an effort early to say, this is the best possible solution. So if the finance group comes, comes back to town hall building committee and says, we think the will of the people will, no, will support up to X number and no more, that's what I would recommend you, you on the building committee shoot for. But you need, you need, in fairness to you, you need that kind of information to really do this and, and have it successful. You, you've got to get consensus. And the only way to get consensus is to get out early and often and build. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Michelle, at one point, was there talk of a possible grant for part of this project? So we I don't think any, any work's been done on that as far as I know. Okay. Do you know, Michelle? So we are looking into some opportunities um, with National Grid as um, a subsidy of some items of the mechanics in the town hall. Um, we're, we just submitted an, an MOU with them. They'll be working alongside our architect to see if there's any um, savings they can provide. So we just started that process about two weeks ago. Okay, but... but historic preservation grants or any of the other grants that were, were talked about, nothing's? We are actively looking at those grants. Um, there's nothing on the table as of right now um, to apply for. Any other questions? We're obviously gonna come back to this in the future. So mm -hmm. Don, I think we ought to try to set up a, a get together on getting more detail on the financing options. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You know me, I'm available anytime. Okay. Yeah. Sam? Maybe, not, maybe not anytime, but uh, pretty close. <laughs> you're the man. You mean you're not wide open. Right, right. Quick question, Sam. Yes. Um, is the actual appropriation for this upcoming town meeting to be 700,000? Yes. Is that, that's what it is? That's my understanding what's going to be on the warrant. So that's going to be paid for out of the operating budget. I believe so. so that's but it, very will interesting. Probably, it will probably be an amount that will eventually get rolled into the cost of Understand. town hall down the road. But we're, we're able to squeeze 700000 out, in other words, in order to pay for the architectural development of this building. Well, I, Don's going to have to answer that well, question. That's what you're pro asking for an appropriation, right? Yeah, you can say you're going to appropriate it, but then you have to actually spend it. Yeah. So it okay. could come partly out of fiscal year 21 and partly out of fiscal year 22. I, I have no idea. I haven't even seen the uh, projected budget for fiscal year 22 yet. Okay. Which would be helpful if we could get it. What, what were you looking for, Sam? Um, you know your five-year budget projection? 
yeah. for the town as a whole. Can we get a copy of that? Uh, yeah, I'll send it to you. Whenever. Shortly. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll share exactly what I shared at the, uh, the Joint Select Board Advisory Committee meeting last week or the week before. No, I know. I looked in on it. Um, anything else on town hall at this point? Yes, Mark. So just to just to add to, I mean, you know, we talk about the, the project success and, um, and and I think one of the things that we, we we talk about in the committee is the is if we had done it differently back in when the annex was put on, maybe we wouldn't be in this position. And we just sit here and we talk about designing to um, number versus the need. You know, we established the need from a program standpoint. Um, there are certain things that based on square footage that each department needs, certain aspects of the second floor of old town hall is very structurally constraining due to the trusses. It's not a, a floor plate that we can wipe clean and most efficient as we'd want to be because of the structure. Um, and so to, to design to, to put together a project strictly based on the dollar figure, uh, I'd, be, I'd be weary that we sit here years later wishing we had made it bigger because we were, we were busting at the seams the day we built it. It, it just doesn't seem to be um, the most effective way to approach it. And to spend 10, 11, $12 million to get there when we could have got what we needed for 14, because um, we won't get another chance at it. We'll be able to remodel it over the next 50 years, but we won't be able to add a thousand square feet. This is this is our chance. Um, and that's, that's again, part of, there's it's a very efficient layout, but it's also part of it was the whole basement wasn't programmed for the potential need of something. Um, Old Town Hall basement is not usable due to the height of Old Town Hall, but there was some thought that went into the fact that we have to we, we still need to fully design all of our mechanical systems that we're going to try and put as much in Old Town Hall as we can, but we realize that we may need some of the basement of the new town of the new addition to use that square footage. Um, and then the what if that nobody has a crystal ball in 20 years from now, what do we need to put in there? And again, this is our chance. Um, and we won't be able to add square footage very easily or very efficiently after this. Thank you. Any other town hall comments, questions? Nope. Well, thank you. I'd like to see if we can get some past minutes approved if possible. Um, so those involved in the town hall building committee and Vertex and, and you as the architects, you don't have to stick around. Thank you very much for- Thank you. Thank you. Coming up and contributing. It's good to see everybody. Okay. Has every, everybody on capital budget had a chance to read the December 14th minutes? Yes. Any additions or corrections? No. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Sam, I, I have not read them, so I'm going to abstain. Brian? I can't, can't seem to find them. I'm sure they're here. I haven't either. Yeah. yeah. Sam, unless we know, we, you know, it's hard to remember whether we have or we haven't. So I'm not sure I know. So. Well, I, the, the minutes of December 14th, January 4th, January 25th and February 1st have all been sent out. I can, we can delay this and I can send them out all out again and make sure that you all have them, is that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think the key thing is for us to know in advance that we're going to actually be voting on them, so we're prepared in advance as well, that's all. Well, I had it on the agenda. Susan, I'm sorry, I hope you're not too disappointed. 
Yes, Michelle. So I, in the past, I was getting copies of the minutes and was able to upload them to OneDrive so everyone would get notification when they were uploaded. I don't know if that would be helpful if you want me to continue to do that. Um, but if you do, just send them along and I'll upload them to the OneDrive so everyone can access them. That probably makes sense. Do we think that makes sense for everybody? But it certainly helps. And, yeah, sorry. and then there are, you know where they are. Uh, even if they had gotten sent to you individually, you can always go to OneDrive to look them up. Does that make sense, Susan? Sure. Sorry, I keep turning my mic off because my dogs are right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will, um, I will send you, Michelle, all the minutes that I have, okay? We can put them up on OneDrive, and then in the future, when minutes are produced, um, <clears throat> we'll get. I'll make sure you get them, and you can get them up on OneDrive. Perfect. So next meeting, which will probably be next Monday, is my guess. Um, let's plan on trying to get some of these minutes approved. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Because we're getting a backlog, and I do have CRS disease, so getting back into December is very difficult. Um, if less anybody has anything else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Brian? Aye. Francine? Aye. Susan? Aye. Ralph? Aye. Sam? Aye. And Mike, you're an associate, so you don't have to vote on that, the adjournment. Yay! <laughs> so All I'll good. send Thank out you. an agenda for next Monday. I'm not totally sure what's going to be on it. And then um, those of us who have questions on the school's pilot program, if you could put those in writing and send them to Lisa. Uh, you better send them to Patrick. Shouldn't we and consolidate send, send a copy to me, or maybe just to everybody on capital budget so they understand Sam, I, I, think we're we're asking. Have, I think we all have some questions on the pilot program. Would it make more sense to to, to send one email to Lisa and, and the rest of the folks rather than all of us sending separate emails? Yeah, if you want to send them to me, I will consolidate and then send it on, if that makes sense. Sounds good. Okay. And when would you like them by, Sam? Give us a deadline. Tomorrow. <laughs> End of day tomorrow? You have I don't know. Well, you. you know, I don't want to drag it out too long, and time yeah. is going. So the sooner you get them, the better. Okay. I hear you. So thank you all very much. It's Great. good to see you're all still well. And yes, and you're still alive. Take nourishment. And I get my second shot Thursday, so I'll hopefully be bulletproof. Yeah. Right. Ah, sure. Sam, could I ask you a quick uh, question? Yes. So you had mentioned, uh, you know, getting a meeting together, talk about financing. When, when would you like to do that? And who would you like to have join that meet? Would you like it? you me and brian again sorry to throw you out there brian but we can yeah you know, we can certainly that. do that um does anybody else want to join that i think i'd like to just listen in just for education yeah okay yeah, I, would, I would too thank you All right, so it would just have to be then a, a public meeting then well i don't want that to hold things up uh, yeah yeah so if you guys so, just want to say something up go ahead by all means you want to do it as a public meeting well, if you have more, if you have a quorum, you're going to have to. Well, we need we need three for a quorum, so that'd make it a public meeting. Yeah, Sam. Maybe let me suggest the following. 
why don't you and I follow up with Don on the conversation we had last week and try and get that top line number resolved. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then from there, why don't we put this on the, uh, on the agenda for one of our upcoming meetings to dig further down into how to make that top line number work, given the various requests. And we'll do okay. that with a broader group. Great That's idea. Good idea. Great. So Don, you tell us when you're gonna be available because you probably have the most difficult schedule. I'm pretty wide open, Brian. You're sort of wide open. I'm pretty wide open and, and uh, Don, I'm ready to go. I've kind of worked the math around and I think we can resolve this really quickly. Okay, let me um, let me just check my, my calendar and I'll email you guys tonight and see what you have available. Okay, okay. perfect. Good right. enough. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Well, thank Good night. you for hosting. Can we have cookies and donuts next time? <laughs> Virtual. Virtual. Oh, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Good night.